pleasure to be back down in warm Australia. Uh, always nice to pop down over the Pacific, see what's going on down here. Um, yeah, I've really enjoyed a few days so far in uh, Sydney and up in the mountains, and uh, yeah, it's nice to meet a few more of you uh, at last. Um, the title I've given the, uh, this morning's uh, first session is, is Christian Pedagogy, the Gaps in the Wall. Uh, and that might already evoke some connections for you. Um, talk about gaps in the wall uh, immediately. By the way, I'm going to use the screen, so if you've got really bad sight lines, you might want to consider moving around. Feel free. Thank you. Um, the gaps in the wall might immediately when you think of the, uh, the book of Nehemiah, where the Israelites come back from exile in Babylon, and they find that the wall around the city of Jerusalem is in ruins. It's got, it's got gaps in it. Uh, and they set about rebuilding. Um, oddly enough, I couldn't find many photos online of them doing this. Um, but uh, this will have to do as a mere substitute. And um, just two thoughts to leave hanging about gaps in walls. Um, one is that if your wall's got gaps in it and it's meant to protect your city, then it's not a lot of good boasting about how good the standing sections are. Um, having gaps in the wall invalidates the whole enterprise. Uh, so it's not until you've actually dealt with the gaps that you've got a wall, no matter how impressive the, the brickwork on the sections that are actually standing. But the flip side of that is that when you've got gaps in your wall, you don't tear down the existing sections to fill up the gaps. It might seem obvious, but I'm a little concerned, given that I'm going to criticise a few things as I go along. I think we're often used, especially in the West, to thinking in either or opposites. Um, but if we decide one thing's not so good, then we throw it out and we go for the next thing. Um, I don't want to throw out anything that I'm going to talk about this morning. I want to suggest there are still some gaps. There are still some things that need to fill in. We need to keep some of what we have um, and not tear it down to fill the gaps. That just makes new gaps. Uh, but there are still gaps. So that's just an image to frame where we're going. My basic question whenever I say anything to anybody it typically has something to do with this. What does Christian have to do with education? Um, how do you make that connection? How do you join the two? So there's not a whole lot in the New Testament about teaching differential equations. Um, salvation seems to be something different from science teaching. The Bible is strangely silent on correcting this word order. Um, not a lot of pedagogical advice in the New Testament. How do you get from Christian to education? How do you take something that, in the form in which you're practicing it, wasn't even invented until recent historical times? Schools, post-industrial, big collections of people in brick buildings, following curricula that reflect modern ways of organizing knowledge. How do you take that and claim that it's Christian? What might you mean by that? How might you make that connection in some way that's justifiable? Because that's a difficult question, it turns out there's a lot of different answers to it. And as you travel around and look at different schools and talk to different Christians and so on, you'll find there's a lot of little bits of wall standing. I'm not going to have time to do a big survey, but I do want to look at a few of them and suggest why they still leave gaps. So as a first candidate, how do you connect Christian to education? Well, that's an understandable instinct that says, well, it must have something to do with the Bible. So to make education Christian, you've got to get the Bible into education. Um, you've got to teach the Bible to children. You've got to put the Bible on posters on your walls. You've got to include references to scripture in your teaching um, in some way. Some, some groups of schools talk about biblical integration wanting to integrate the Bible into their curriculum? Well, yes. Or yes, as you say here. Um, there is some kind of connection between Christian and Bible. Uh, and so, if you want what you're doing to be Christian, then yeah, it's got to have some kind of defensible connection to Scripture. Scripture is where your notion of what Christian is ought to come from. Um, and certainly if you're seeking to educate kids, then that ought to include some kind of encounter with scripture. Um, so again, I want to leave this piece of wall standing. But I want to suggest that it also creates some gaps. Um, I don't spend a lot of time on this. We could actually spend a long time talking about this. There's lots of interesting ins and outs around this. But let's just look at a quick example. 
Uh, this might be a little small for those of the back, so I'll read it to you. It's a worksheet from the math curriculum that I run across. It says, Comparing, chapter 5, review. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Matthew 8, 26. Are you fearful or trusting during the stormy, rough times of life? There are several methods for comparing fractions. <laughs> One method is to cross multiply, which I sincerely, sincerely hope wasn't intended as a theological reference. <laughs> this method could be used with any pair of fractions. Now if you were following along really closely, you might have noticed a slight change of topic between the second and the third um, Now I suspect that this came out of a healthy impulse, an impulse to try to get the word of God into education. Um, what it's failing to take into account, and this is going to become a theme in everything I talk about, what it's failing to take into account is that as soon as you take this saying out of Scripture and you put it on a worksheet, it's no longer just Scripture. It's entered into a pedagogical process, a teaching and learning process that has its own momentum and its own trajectory. It's now playing a role in an episode of teaching and learning. And so the question is now not just, is this sentence true? The question is, what is this sentence doing right here, educationally, in this context? And I look at this and I start asking myself, what is it doing? Is it teaching students that the best way to read scripture is in random one sentence length quotations, like the sayings of Confucius, which sadly is a way that a lot of Western Christians access scripture a lot of the time. Is this teaching students the context doesn't matter? You just take a sentence from here, a sentence from there, and as long as it's a blessed thought, it's good enough. Well, is, this, is this teaching students bad hermeneutics, bad interpretive skills, bad ways of interacting with scripture? Random verse at the top of each worksheet. Is it also teaching students that the Bible has nothing to do with the rest of life? Might seem an odd thing to say because clearly the author here is trying to say that the Bible has something to do with all of life. But this scripture text has nothing to do with the mathematical processes that follow it. At least I can't find the connection. Maybe the author was worried about kids with math anxiety or something. I don't know. But, um, I can't find a connection between Matthew 8.26 and cross multiplying fractions. So, is, what the, is this really teaching that as long as you actually quote scripture and do something pious at the start of the process, then you go on and do whatever it was you were going to do anyway? That you quoted scripture, that makes you Christian. Um, is this any different from having the Christian bumper sticker on your car and then cheating on your tax return? So is this really teaching a disconnect? Is this teaching that scripture doesn't actually do anything? It's a nice decoration to make us feel righteous, to make us feel Christian to make us feel distinctive and different from the rest of the world. Is that what it's teaching? Maybe. Maybe it provides a moment of comfort for a student in the middle of math class. I'm not saying God can't speak through donkeys. But the point of that story is not that you go looking for donkeys and make them your prophets. Um, so this first thing, by all means, makes scripture part of what makes education Christian. You've got to ask questions about what it's doing pedagogically when it gets placed into the teaching and learning setting. It's not enough for it to be true. Once it enters into a teaching learning situation, it's doing educational things. And we've got to think through some of those processes. Then we get a second possibility. This one's pretty popular at the place where I teach, which is to say, it's something to do with ideas. It's something to do with your mind. You need a Christian mind. You've got to think Christianly. It's to do with the ideas that get transferred from one brain into another. And as long as those are Christian ideas, that will be Christian education. It doesn't matter if you quote Bible verses on your worksheets, but you've got to make sure that there's Christian worldview, or a Christian mind, or a Christian perspective, or Christian assumptions, or Christian presuppositions. You've got lots of different ways of talking about this in different corners of the Christian education world. Integration of faith and learning. Um, but most of these always end up having something to do with there are some ideas in my head or in my curriculum plan and they're Christian ideas and I need to get those over to these other brains sitting in front of me so that they've got some Christian ideas 
Um, and yeah, we need some of that. It's another important component, another piece of wall that we need to leave standing. But maybe it has some gaps around it. Here's why we need to leave it standing. My son, a few years ago, took a, an advanced placement biology class in his Christian high school. Um, so a, a class that carried um, higher education credit it was an advanced biology class. And uh, it was a brand new class, it was the first time this, this course had happened at school, and so what they, what they did was they simply bought a standard college level biology textbook uh, and used that as the main text for the class. So at the start of the year, I'm sitting, leafing through this textbook, um, lots of interesting stuff in there. I mean, who knew there were that many kinds of fungus? Um, and uh, lots of useful scientific information of a variety of kinds. And then I come to a page that's all about the widespread evidence of large <coughs> meteorite impacts on the Earth, places where there are huge craters where big lumps of rock have landed. Um, and you know, there are these various ideas about how this might be how the dinosaurs died out and climate change and so on and so forth. So it was talking through some of this. And then it started talking about statistically, you know, how many pieces of rock there are flying around space of an average size and what the statistical <laughs> likelihood is of, in any given 10,000 year period of one of these big lumps of rock landing somewhere and the impact that that would have and how it might change the weather and so on. And it comes to the conclusion at the end of the page that really it's pretty much statistical fluke that there are any human beings left on Earth because by the law of averages we ought to have been wiped out by a big rock by now. Um, and so it's statistical accident that there are any students actually reading this book. I flip on a few pages further and there's an interesting page about the chemical composition of the human body. And it tells you that you consist of so much carbon and so much potassium and so much of this and so much of that. Um, I've already told you about as much chemistry as I know. And um, it goes down the list, and it's, for each one it gives you the market value of this much potassium and this much carbon and so on. And I think it came to the conclusion at the end of the page that a human being is worth about $9.35. <laughs> um, now, neither of these proposals that the only reason you're still here is by pure statistical fluke that the rock didn't land on you yet, and that you're worth about nine and a half dollars. I'm not sure either of those are particularly Christian conclusions, at least not without a lot of further discussion. Um, so there are some ideas in this textbook that we need to take some care with. You can't just take a biology textbook and just because what it says about photosynthesis is accurate, assume that it's telling the truth uh, on all of its pages. So yeah, Christian ideas are important, but again, these ideas enter into a pedagogical process. They enter into a teaching and learning process. And then interesting things start to happen. A few weeks into the semester, I asked my student, my, my son, what he thinks of the textbook. Because um, I'm wondering, have they, have they discussed some of these things in class? He looked at me and said, I hate that textbook with a passion. Um, I said, how much have you read? Have you read? He said, maybe four or five pages. So I started watching him doing his homework. Now, the teacher for this class was assigning homework worksheets which had questions about biological information based on one of the chapters in the textbook, and you were supposed to read the chapter in the textbook and fill in the answers to the questions on the worksheet. Well, the most rational and efficient way of doing that is not to read 25 pages of a boring textbook. The most rational and efficient way of doing that, if you have a computer and an internet connection, is Google and Wikipedia. It's a lot faster. And it's pretty much as accurate, actually. Um, and in fact, it's even more efficient if you have a little chat window open in the corner so that you're networking with five or six other students um, so that you can divide and conquer and look up the information between you. This way you can get the task done in about 20 minutes, you've got the correct information, you get a good grade in the class, and you never need to read this wretched textbook. So the ideas in this textbook were important. What was happening with these ideas I'm not sure it was even what the teacher thought was happening with the ideas. They enter into a teaching and learning process and there's other things going on. Here's another example. Another of my son's classes was a religion class. It was when he was about 15, 16. And he came home one day and he had a worksheet that looked a little bit like this. Down the left hand side, of course it's longer, but down the left hand side it had a list of theological words, 12 of them, good words, justification, sanctification, kingdom of God, 
Ascension, Trinity, and so on. Down the right hand side was a set of paragraphs defining each of these words. A little bit longer than these, but not much longer. And he said to me, he said, would you help me study? I've got a test on Friday. I said, sure, I'll help you study. And so we sit down in the lounge, and I take up the sheet, and I start trying to ask him hard questions. So what's the difference between justification and sanctification? How would you recognize either one if you found it in the salad? <laughs> Can you tell me a story that, that illustrates one or other of these? Can you think of a Bible text that, that refers to it in some way? Can you give me an example? Um, after about three or four minutes of this, he tossed the sheet of paper down on the table and he said, but I don't need to understand them that well. <laughs> I've told this story to a lot of teachers and the scary thing is they all know what he said next. He said, I don't need to understand them that well because on the test, they're just going to make me match the words with the definitions. Now he's not being lazy at this point. Um, any more than he was with the science activity. He's being perfectly rational. In fact, he's got a pretty good grasp of pedagogical process here. Because he's right. He doesn't need to understand them. We can demonstrate this very easily by translating the worksheet into wingdings. <laughs> now, if you're a good student, which you all are because you've got this far, you know how to do this. In fact, given that we've only got three items on the list here, we just need to memorize the first character of each one. So we need to know that smiley face goes with three fingers, that snowflake goes with snowflake, and that two fingers goes with smiley face. Um, so you got that? Smiley face, three fingers, snowflake, snowflake, two fingers, smiley face. All right, we good? Here's the test. Let's do a multiple choice. What's the answer? B, e, well done. I'm glad you understood this material so profoundly and have such a good grasp of the underlying concepts. Um, what this clearly illustrates is that if the test is a matching test or a multiple choice test, and of course, how does my son know that it's going to be a matching test or a multiple choice test? He's making a generalization based on his experience of school. He's saying whenever they give me information that looks like this, the test, the test almost always looks like that. So he's making a prediction based on experience. And he's already figured out that if that's the shape of the test, you do not need to understand the material. In fact, if the test is a multiple choice or a matching test, you don't even need to understand the language in which the material is written, let alone the actual concepts of the material. You just need to be able to memorize correspondences. Now, I know that his teacher, who I think is one of the best teachers in the school, creative, engaged, deeply thoughtful about what she's doing, one of my daughter's heroes, I know that that teacher did not walk into class that morning with a lesson plan that said, today I want to teach my 15 year old students that they don't need to understand Christian theology. <coughs> That's what was learned. <coughs> not because of the ideas. You could not make this worksheet more Christian if you tried. It's just a list of theological words and their definitions. The ideas are not the problem. It's not a pagan worksheet. The problem is the pedagogical process. It's been put in a teaching and learning process and it's doing other things. Other things are happening. Ideas like Bible verses start doing strange things when you put them in classrooms. So here's a third possibility. What's going to make your education Christian is not going to be just whether you've got a Christian mind and whether you've got Bible verses on your worksheets. It's going to be because you are a total knockout saint. Um, you're just glowing with humility and patience, you never lose your temper, um, you, you get everything graded on time, you, you, you're just always ready with a, with a word of consolation and wisdom for your students, um, and you just walk around with this faint glow emanating from the back of your head for most of the school day. Well, yeah, of course. There's something to this. Um, not the glow necessarily, but all other things being equal, I would rather that my children were taught by people who are at least working on humility, gentleness, patience, self-control, than people who are sarcastic, self-centered, power-hungry, manipulative, and mean. Wouldn't you? Um, so there's something to this. This is not a dumb idea. Um, but again, 
there are gaps around it because what happens when personal character steps into a classroom and becomes part of a pedagogical process? Well, it's something that happened to me about a year ago in one of my classes. I, I train teachers. So this was a teacher education class. I was, I was training folk to teach languages. And um, the particular class that I was teaching, my plan for the day was I needed to teach my students how to conduct an oral drill, how to teach some vocabulary orally so the students might learn it. And I often come into class and do simulations uh, as, I'm, as I'm teaching my education course. Almost every day I will come in and teach in a different style depending on what philosophy of education we've been reading and then the students are expected to unpick what we've been doing together. And so I decided what I was going to do this day was to come in and teach badly for the first five minutes. And so what I did was I, I came to class and I waited outside for a little while until I was about a minute and a half late, uh, just, to, just to get off on a good note. And, uh, and so then I kind of sauntered into the classroom. I made sure not to make eye contact with anybody in the classroom. And I sort of wandered over to my, there's a podium in the corner there, and I shuffled with my papers for a minute or two, like I wasn't really quite sure what we were going to do today. And then I sort of wandered over to the front, and there's a, there's a big desk across the front, and I kind of leaned back against the desk, shoulders slumped a little bit, um, and I looked up at the students. One of the students said, well, oh, you've got no energy today. I said, yeah, tough week. And, uh, yeah, um, I said, right, today we're going we're gonna to learn how to do some, some speaking drills um, in, a, in a language class, and so you're used to us doing simulations, so we're going to try this out a little bit. And I had some flashcards with pictures of animals on them, a dog and a cat and a snake or something. And so I start teaching them these words in German. I hold up a picture of a dog, der Hund, der Hund, der Hund, keeping my voice on a nice monotone, just to make it difficult for the brain to latch on to anything that I'm saying. Um, and I was, I was very careful to not repeat each word more than about four times before moving on to the next one, just to make it impossible to actually remember it. Um, because it wouldn't get transferred from working memory into long-term memory. Um, so that, that just guaranteed that every time we moved on to a new word, they forgot the last one and didn't actually learn any of them. And so we went through this for a minute or two, and then I put them in pairs and asked them to work with a partner, and I gave them a task where they had to ask their partner what pets they had, and they had to say whether they had a dog or a cat. And of course they couldn't do it because they couldn't remember any of the words. And so at this point, I was racing around the classroom, sort of fighting fires because they all were, you know, what, what was the German word for what was the German word for a cat? And I'm running around the classroom telling them the words. And then we come back together and I start asking them personal questions. Do you have a dog? Do you have a cat? And I just made sure that when they answered the question that I broke eye contact a split second before they finished speaking. <laughs> and at this point, I stopped. I said, take out a piece of paper, you've got two minutes to write down all the reasons why I should lose my job if I teach this way. And I walked out of the room. And I gave him two minutes. Um, and then I came back into the room and I was teacher number two. I was a good teacher. I, I, had, I had good energy, good body language, I made eye contact with as many people as possible on the way into the room. Um, I, my voice was a little more cheerful. Um, I started into the activity, I, we went through the drill with lots of repetitions and varying it in different sentence structures and using, using intonation patterns, using loud and quiet to make it interesting. Um, so they learned the words pretty well, then we went into pairs and it worked and they could remember the words and they